Well, hi everybody. Welcome to another digital piano review here on Miriam Pianos. Today, we are looking at Casio's brand new PXS 5000, and we're gonna be comparing it directly to the PXS 1100, which is a pretty close cousin. So we thought it would be a helpful video, uh, both as a first look for the 5000, but also to compare it to uh, something that's already out there and very familiar to you all. We're gonna be taking a look at its action, talking about its sound and the other features, and the usual uh, and examination that we, uh, we do here on the channel. So thank you so much for joining us. If it's the first time that you've seen us here on YouTube, we would really love if you hit that subscribe and notification bell, helps us keep growing the channel, doing what we do, and hopefully you'll come back for more and keep enjoying uh, the videos. So without further ado, let's hop right in to this first look at Casio's PXS 5000 right away. So the new PXS 5000 has only been out for a few days and I already can tell where the online dialogue or conversation is going to go, which is essentially, is the 5000 really just an overpriced 1100 with a bit of a rebranded action? Uh, and I know it's going there because I had exactly the same thoughts when I first saw the spec sheet, I saw the price and I'm thinking, okay. Yes, uh, on paper the action seems like they have done some redesigning, but uh, I don't. it doesn't look like the pivot length is necessarily any longer, so have they really addressed some of the concerns that you know, a section of the public had about the 1100 previously? Uh, it didn't seem like maybe there was much different about the tone generator, speakers seem the same, and I'm like, okay, this is gonna be a hard uh, price gap uh, to, to try and wrap my head around. Uh, and if I'm having trouble doing that, well, no doubt other people are going to uh, kind of jump all over this. So I will admit at the top of this video uh, that I was somewhat skeptical about the 5000 when I first saw it announced and I was reading through the specs. And then I played the 5000 and, and then I thought, well, this, this feels pretty good. It sounds pretty good. Um, but is it really any better or much different than the 1100? And it wasn't until I got them side by side, which we've done here today, when I realized that there are actually substantial differences in the piano tone and the action, not on paper, I'm not talking about spec, I'm talking about the actual playing experience, uh, is pretty meaningfully different. And I was really very surprised. And so uh, I hope that anybody out there who is in my position to be able to offer up an opinion in a public way uh, really has a chance to get these two keyboards side by side because I would hazard a guess that if you do, uh, you're gonna be as pleasantly surprised as I was uh, to realize how differently the action feels, how differently the action behaves, um, and maybe more surprisingly, um, the fact that the piano sound and, and the behavior, the dynamics uh, of the piano are just f way more rich, like in a completely different class than what was on the 1100. And I'm not trying to use hyperbole, I'm really uh, genuinely speaking from the heart about, uh, about my, my impressions of these two instruments. So, uh, you know, you could look at the 5000 as an upgrade to the 1100, they're going to be offered uh, you know, simultaneously moving forward, the 1100 is still a very current model. Uh, there's the 3100, but now there's this 5000, 6000, um, and 7000. Uh, let's talk about the sound specs uh, right off the top. Not that they're, to be honest, that meaningful when we're doing this comparison. Um, they both have uh, 192 notes worth of maximum polyphony. Uh, they are both a pair of 8 watt speakers. Um, those speakers had some level of redesign from the 1000 to the 1100. The, the cone was uh, uh, coated uh, with a different material to, to give it a little more clarity uh, in the high end and it was allowed to have a little bit more travel uh, for the lower frequencies. So 
you know, Casio's um, claim was that the speaker was, was just generally a, a wider spectrum response uh, speaker than what was originally in the 1000. And that is, I'm saying this because that's also uh, what's been continued on here uh, into uh, the 5000. Uh, we have uh, basically the same number of sounds offered on both. They both have exactly the same functionality. They both have exactly the same, uh, you know, user interface. Uh, the ports on the back are the same. So, you know, from a guts standpoint, um, there isn't a huge level of difference between these two instruments. One notable thing on paper that stands out is that they're, uh, you know, they're talking about the fact that they've got the Hamburg Grand Sample included in the 5000. And this is the sample and the uh, tone emulation technology that goes along with it that they had in their hybrids, the GP310 and the GP510. But there was some ambiguous language when the 1100 first came out about an updated grand piano sample. So I'm thinking in the back of my head, well, did they really just put the Hamburg on the 1100 as well, but didn't articulate that that's what they'd done, and now they're making more hay out of it by talking about it on the 5000? Uh, well, having got these two side by side, I can emphatically say that that is not the case. We are talking about an utterly different sample, uh, and for those who are familiar with the term soundstage, when you are playing the 5000 with a really good set of headphones, because you don't get this impression when you're just using the onboard speakers, but when you've got a really great set of headphones, um, and I'm going to be using uh, the Meze 99 Classics, which is you know a pair that I came to uh, find out about several months ago and sort of become my new fave for like a nice uh, mid-range uh, listening headphone. You can really, really hear uh, and in your mind paint this 3D space where you're in front of a piano and you, and, and you can pick out exactly what's happening where you can really uh, come up with, with that um, spatial uh, impression uh, of being in front of a real piano, whereas uh, you're really straining to do that uh, with the 1100. So there is quite a meaningful difference in the acoustic piano uh, sonic experience on these two instruments. Uh, and before we move on to anything else, I'm actually going to give you a chance to hear that side by side. Now to ensure that it is a perfect comparison, we've got the volume set the same, and this isn't that sophisticated, but it will deliver a parallel side by side comparison. I'm actually literally just going to press play on the demo of both of these at exactly the same time and we will fade back and forth between the two and while we're doing that I'm also going to be listening on headphones uh, just to give myself yet another um, experience of hearing those two samples side by side. So here we go. And go. So this is what I'm hearing off an identical MIDI file being played through otherwise an identical machine. Um, I'm hearing way more detail in the lower mid-range of the piano, like significantly more detail through here.
than over here. It's so different. The other place I was really hearing it was in the upper mid-range of the piano, right on the attack, the transients. Um, there was so much more color and width and uh, just, uh, just depth to, to that moment of attack on what's been captured on the 5000 versus over here on the 1100, which at times kind of comes off as just a little harsh. Not uncharacteristic, honestly, for this price range. So sure, it's a criticism, but you, you know you always have to temper these things with the price point uh, of of the the price point and the attendant audience uh, of the instrument. But versus this. So really to round off my first big point, you're not getting the same acoustic piano experience. Um, you can really hear it on, uh, with headphones. You can pick up moments of it uh, through the speakers, although the speakers just are not detailed enough to, uh, to really um, make those differences a huge deal. So if you're not gonna be using this with, speaker, or with headphones, the 5000, first of all, you're missing out on a really killer uh, sample set. That's, that's clearly been put together. And it's the same one that you're gonna get on the 310, the 510, as I mentioned. If it's just through the speakers, there may be glimpses of that, uh, but you're gonna to have to be in the right room. Acoustics are gonna to have to be right. You really need to have your ears tuned up. Otherwise, um, it, the, the, the differences in the clarity that I was talking about and the upper end I was talking about are gonna be pretty subtle. But there's also a timbre difference just generally between these two samples and you may just have a preference for one versus the other. Um, this is a little brighter and a little clearer, whereas the uh, onboard sample uh, for the 1100 tends to be a little uh, darker. I wouldn't necessarily say warmer, uh, just slightly colder, a, a, a darker, colder sound. Uh, now, through the rest of the range of sounds, I don't really detect any difference at all, which is another uh, kind of marker that we're not talking about uh, you know, much of a change with amplifiers or speakers. As soon as we get off that main sample, we're pretty much apples to apples. Yeah. Some of the sounds don't exactly line up with this.
yeah, I'm not hearing any difference anytime I'm getting those lined up. So there's a few extra sounds on the 5000 which make it uh, not quite possible to do an exact comparison of, of uh, sample to sample. So there's a few extra pianos uh, that are on uh, the 5000 that aren't on there. Uh, it could actually just be literally that it's exactly the same set, but it's just been moved over uh, by one or two to make room for uh, that Homburg Grand. Um, so the meaningful difference here uh, definitely on the acoustic. Um, we're going to take a break and come back and talk about the action because that's the other really big discussion point here between these two instruments. Uh, so thank you so much for sticking with us. We're going to throw a lot of those vital specs up on a slide and we'll be back in just a second. So now let's dive into the action. Uh, piano actions are not usually very controversial, but when Casio came out with the 1100, or I guess its predecessor, the 1000 and the 3000, and then its uh, successor, the 3100, the action caused a lot of discussion and debate online. And it started uh, really with um, the awareness or acknowledgement or disclosure, pick your word. Uh, that there were some uh, funny weighting differences depending on how you uh, measured the resistance on the keys on the 1100. Um, but that kind of missed the larger point, which was that this was a thing because of how short the pivot length on the key is. You see, when you shorten the key so much to the point where the, the hinge uh, is literally just behind where the key disappears into the machine, you are going to have really large variances in the resistance depending on where it is on the key that you play it. And so the first time around, Casio made the decision, um, although I would have liked if they'd explained this a little bit better. I have not, by the way, received this talking point from Casio and all. This is just my own thoughts on it. Um, but when you are playing into the key bed on any piano, not just the Casio, but on any piano, you are not playing the white key out here, and you are not playing the black key there. Uh, the distance between those two points is often much closer together, and if I just play naturally right now, and look where I'm actually pressing white and black keys, it's gonna be like, here, like a good inch, inch and a half in on the white key. Which means that the weight uh, where I'm actually pressing the white key is going to be heavier than where it would weigh out there. And that's actually where I'm playing the white key. I'm not trying just for the video, this is just naturally where it's just where the fingers lay. Sir, so some you know, some voicings you're kind of torqued around and sometimes you wind up with your thumb right on the very edge. But it's pretty rare. And then on the black key, you usually are fairly close to the tip of the black key. So Casio made the call to weight these keys so that when you were playing the white key around here and playing the black key around there, the weight was essentially the same. But because this is really quite different than what happens on an acoustic piano, which is you can you know, get, relatively speaking, the same resistance no matter where you play on the white key um, when you're this far out, or the first third of the black key. Uh, you know, this, it would have been good to have some explanation go out, I think, in my humble opinion, with that action. So what this means is that in most normal playing situations, it's going to feel fine. Are there going to be a couple of instances, either for advanced players or some really odd chords or voicings or arpeggiated patterns where, you know, a fingering pattern means that you're not quite playing in that same space? Yeah, there's going to be a few spots. 
but those are going to be for more advanced players anyway. Is a beginner really going to notice this? Not a chance. So that was really where the quote unquote controversy came from on this action. I was looking forward to, therefore, on this updated action, to maybe see some extended pivot length on this action. I don't think they have. I think it's the same pivot length. And so without um, much further investigation, it would be really easy to write the 5000's new action off as basically uh, just a rebranded version of what is on the 1100. Um, as I said in my preamble, uh, I'm really glad I got these two side by side because just as the acoustic piano sound is different, I was uh, honestly quite surprised um, at how differently these two actions play uh, given the fact that um, their essential geometry hasn't really changed much. So clearly there's quite a bit else that has changed. First thing I'm going to point out, and I'm going to just kill the volumes. Don't worry, Lee, I marked where the volumes were, so it's not going to be a problem. My sound guy's going to kill me. Uh, there is a really uh, large gap uh, in mechanical noise and mechanical feel between these two actions. So I'm hoping that my lapel mic is going to actually pick this up. If not, we'll just increase the volume for this so you can hear. I'm not going to doctor it in any way. Um, but here's the 1100. So you can hear there's, you know, it's not clicking, but there's like some mechanical looseness there. Anytime I'm hearing my nail hit the key, that sound is, is a little more exaggerated as well. You can hear the, the clicks of the, of the nail uh, definitely more. So it feels a little looser. It sounds a little looser. Here's the 5000. Like it sounds like a completely different action. Now, these keys have wood inserts on the side. And, you know, I, I think sometimes in the keyboard world, we strain to explain what the benefit of putting wood on the side of a, a, a key is. Because there's other actions out there that do it. There are some that have solid, uh, you know, wood keys through it. And then there are other actions where they've got wood sides on it. And it's, this approach has been used by various companies throughout the years. Um, uh, one benefit, which is quite clear, uh, is that anytime your finger is actually touching up against the innards of the other key, it's going to feel more like an acoustic piano key. That might be a non-issue for some people, it might be a big consideration for others, um, but just kind of similar to you know, how some companies would simulate let off or escapement, which is you know, a mechanical anomaly of an acoustic, and they're trying to replicate that on a digital, I guess, in the, in the spirit of familiarity. Uh, you, know, you could make the argument that the wood key certainly does that. Uh, second thing is, is it's adding weight to a key um, rather than a single point of you know, like a lead weight. It's distributing that weight and adding some stiffness to the overall plastic key. Uh, which might make it behave a little bit differently or that's its sense of dynamic resistance might be affected um, by that. That would be really tricky to measure. Uh, it would sort of just be one of those just very subtle instinctual things like does that feel a little bit more real or not. Um, but certainly there's th those that would make that argument. But clearly another one that I didn't even think of until the making of this video is that a hollow plastic key is going to be more resonant, of course, than one that's, that's dampened with wood on all sides. So just for the fact that the sound of your own fingers hitting the key is now much more minimized because this is no longer acting as like a little you know, resonating chamber, essentially, uh, for the, the strikes on top, you quiet the action down. Didn't even think of that. Anyway, so that's, I, I suspect that's one thing that's happening here because there's really no comparison in the, in the mechanical sound of the two. Second is this 
both on the way down and on the way up, is just much better cushioned. The release is quieter and the downstroke is quieter. Kind of reminds me or sounds like the mechanical sound on Kawai's RH3. Honestly, it, it, it really does. It doesn't really sound like, like the Roland PHA4. Kind of feels like the cushioning that they use on the PHA50. Um, but the one it reminds me the most of is the uh, RH3 from Kawai. And then just the lateral motion on the key does seem tighter and you can really feel it on the black keys. There's kind of a, like you can feel it uh, pushing in and out of, of its groove. Whereas here, it feels like it's flexing, but it doesn't feel like it's really coming out of alignment in any way when you do that. So even if the pivot lengths are exactly the same, and Casio can you know, jump in here to correct me because I haven't ripped this apart and got down into like tenths of a millimeter to see whether there's been a minor extension of the pivot length. Um, if there has been, it's for sure minor because you can see that the form factor on these two pianos is identical. There's, there's no extra gap here in which to create that uh, extra pivot length. There is clearly some other meaningful improvements here that's totally changing the playing experience on this action. The last point of difference I'm going to focus on with the action, and I'm not sure whether the overhead camera will pick this up or not, but even if it doesn't, um, we'll get some close-ups and B-roll so that you see what's going on here. Uh, there's this very long linear grain uh, that's uh, simulating ivory, trying to simulate ivory, on the 1100 and the 3100 has the same keys. Um, it's much shinier, there's definitely a sheen to it, uh, and it's a little bit slipperier as well. If you're in a room that's got some humidity and your hands are not naturally super dry, uh, you're probably fine, but on a cold, dry day, um, the 1131 keys feel a little bit more slippery than the 5000s. Uh, same thing on the, on the uh, black keys. When we go over to the 5000, the textures, first of all, are much less exaggerated uh, like they are on the 1100. I would say the 1100, 3100 probably have some of the most exaggerated uh, wood, faux wood textures uh, you know, in the keyboard market. And for some people, they really love that. Um, I'm kind of neutral on it. It doesn't, uh, you know, I like the fact that there's texture there. I prefer texture over not. The, you know, being it more exaggerated is, is a neutral point for me. Um, but uh, it's definitely more on there. Here, we've got uh, something that looks much more uh, like actual ivory. So rather than being just these linear lines, um, it's, it's more randomized, it seems. There's several different patterns that they're using on top of the keys. Um, and the black keys look like the actual texture of real ebony keys. So we've got a difference in the feel of the key. We've got a difference in the cushioning and the dampening, both on the, on the downstroke as well as on the release of the key. We've got those wood sides, which are going to provide you know, a few different benefits. Um, I've already implied that you know the, the debate on that will, I'm sure, be endless, and I've given my two cents, but you know, feel free to chime in. Uh, and the mechanical tightness um, of the action uh, also seems improved. I should definitely point out uh, that this 1100 is a new 1100. Uh, this is not some sort of a rental or a demo or something that's got several hundred hours worth of use. Uh, this has received maybe 10 hours of use uh, within the building. Uh, this one uh, is, is obviously fresh from Casio, so really not um, any difference in the level of use between these two instruments. So that's the conversation on action. In my opinion, when you are going to be charging uh, the extra that Casio is for the 5000, you need an action that is going to compete against uh, you know, uh, the RHC uh, 2 action from Kawhi, which they've got on the KDP 120, which is going to be on the ES 120. Uh, you need something that's going to start to approach like an RH3 because you can access that 
uh, at CN29 level. You can access that at uh, you know ES920, which is more expensive, but it, you know it's not like crazy more expensive uh, than the 5000. Uh, and you need something that's going to uh, totally uh, be able to run with uh, the R8, um, the PHA4 uh, from Roland. So it doesn't feel like the PHA4. That still has a fairly unique feel and a little more of a, of a gutsier, heavier feel. And I, you know, I've made no secret that I'm a big fan of that action. Um, but this takes it uh, from an acceptable, it's not holding you back action which is what I would say is on the 1100, to something that actually gets into a musically enjoyable, um, uh, something that you're, you're actually going to immediately come away with with a nice positive impression. Um, and, and you need that if you're going to uh, be asking for that kind of a raise in the price. Anyway, moving on to our third section on features, user interface, and other miscellaneous items like that. We'll throw a quick slide up on action and we will be back in just a moment. So first off, both of these instruments uh, are uh, come with an optional stand. You can also get a floating three pedal system uh, in the box. They come with just the little uh, plastic pedal, which I don't care whether it's Roland, Casio, Yamaha, Kawai, whoever is giving them out. I hate them, but I get that they are, you know, it's expensive to get the other uh, sustained pedals. And when you're trying to hit price points, this is an area where you could save and you know for people who really want the extra sustain pedal you can charge them the whatever it's going to be 40 50 bucks ish uh, to get that sustain pedal now right now the 1100 is available in three different colors the 5000 uh, for the time being is not available in three colors right now it's just being offered uh, in black you start to get some really cool color options when you get up into the 7000 we'll be covering that in another video uh, but it is just black versus the red, white, and black that you can get with the 1100. They both have quarter inch audio outputs, which are separate from the headphones, uh, which is great. This makes it a gigging keyboard. Um, it retains the ability to be battery operated. I think this is actually an underrated, under discussed feature. Uh, you know, under discussed because it's just so straightforward, right? Like you're just basically putting the power supply uh, inside versus having an adapter. But the flexibility that this gives you as somebody who's going to busk, somebody who uh, might have to do a rehearsal, you know, in, in a room where you're not close to a plug or who knows what the power situation is, uh, it does add some flexibility that keyboard players just aren't used to having, or I should say digital piano players. Uh, aren't used to having. So you can run this off double uh, A's, rechargeable double A's to be nicer to the environment. That's kind of handy. They both have the uh, Bluetooth dongle, which gives you uh, both Bluetooth audio as well as Bluetooth MIDI. And as we're gonna be covering in a separate video, they are both gonna be compatible with the new Casio Music Space, which is an app giving you the remote control functionality, uh, gives you some of that online learning functionality, and a curious feature known as, I believe, the concert simulator or, or something to that effect. We'll get into that when we, when we cover the app, but the point is that they will both be and are compatible. Uh, on mobile devices, uh, both Apple as well as Android. Um, you've got onboard uh, sound mode, so you can have, uh, this is essentially covering the reverb engine as well as the 3D simulator. Uh, you've got split mode, you've got uh, dual mode. There is a basic onboard recorder. Um, I don't use that type of thing very much, but some people do. I tend to just plug it into uh, computer or a mobile device because it's just so much more handy than doing those on board recordings, but it is an option. And if I didn't mention it already, the basics like transpose and metronome. So uh, in some regards, certainly you could say that the 5000 is a reworked 1100, but that would be missing two gigantic uh, components when you're talking about a digital piano. 
In fact, you might make the argument that you're missing the two gigantic components if it's not part of the conversation, which is the upgrade to the piano acoustic tone, um, which hopefully this has come through in the video as clear as it is here, really a meaningfully upgraded uh, Hamburg Grand Sample uh, over what's already there. And then two, the action. And even though they haven't completely reinvented the geometry on this, the playing experience is like night and day. And so anybody who uh, really wants to know just how big a difference, do what I've done. Get them side by side, and then uh, hopefully you have exactly the same experience I have, which is this is a different beast. This is a different beast. It behaves differently, feels better, uh, and my guess would be that it's probably going to get even longer life uh, out of this if the cushioning has been improved and the mechanics have been improved. Hope you've enjoyed this comparison between the 1100 and its very closely related cousin, the 5000, because I suspect this is going to become um, quite the, the, uh, the relevant discussion when it comes to this model. Like, how much better is it than the 1100? So hopefully we beat the internet to the punch and address that question as best as we can, but we look forward to your comments. And if it is the first time that you have found us here on YouTube, we would really appreciate if you hit that subscribe button and notification bell so that you can join our community of piano lovers from all over the world, leave comments, and come back for more. My name is Stu Harrison. This has been Marion Pianos on YouTube, and we'll see you again soon. <laughs>